Michael Keatley had worked his entire life as a mechanic in Ruskin Sun City, Florida. Starting out his early days with his head buried under the hoods of vehicles, he would soon enroll in an aviation mechanic school and would spend most of his life from that point working on small planes until Delta Airlines hired him and he begins working on jets. He did this for about nine years until around 2008 when he was laid off due to company cutbacks. From here on out, he would find himself between work. When he was 39 years old, in 2009, he would meet a woman by the name of Stacy Rogan. And what did you do for a living in 2009 when you uh, dated Mr. Keatley? Owned and operated an ice cream truck. And what color was your ice cream truck? Purple. And what area did you work? Riverview. How long did you do that for? How long were you an ice cream truck driver? Mm, about 20 years. And what was the name of your business? Ice cream chick. Ice cream chick, like yes. C H I C K. Yes, in two thousand and nine, when you were dating Mr. Keatley, was he an ice cream truck driver? Not when we first met. After you began dating him, um, did he soon thereafter become employed or get a job? He started uh, his own ice cream truck. And how did he go about doing that? Um, he purchased a van and I taught him what to do and he started doing it. Under Stacy's guidance, as you heard, Michael would purchase a van and set it up to sell ice cream. He tore open the roof and replaced it with his own design of metal sheets so that he could stand inside of it comfortably. He painted the van purple and cut open a service window on the side so that he could serve people with cold treats. The neighborhoods that he would predominantly service were known to be pretty rough areas, with lots of gang activity and high crime rate, but within a short amount of time, he became rather well known and was affectionately referred to as the ice cream truck man. This life of an ice cream truck dealer was not one without difficulties. On one of his routes, a man would jump through the service window and had snatched Michael's money bag. In response, Michael reinforces this window so that it couldn't happen again, and he had begun to carry a firearm with him on his runs. As time goes on, he would begin to branch out and started selling drinks and nachos. Michael enjoyed this work and said that he felt as though his life was turning around, but he was very wary of being robbed again and would always end his days before nightfall to avoid the dangerous gang activity. Stacy and Michael would break up in late 2009, but maintained contact as friends. In January of 2010, the ice cream truck man once again comes face to face with a horrible situation. He calls Stacy to tell her about what happened, and she learns that $12 was stolen from his van and that he was shot during the robbery. The date was January 23rd, and Michael says that he was on a regular route selling ice cream. He had wrapped up around 6 p.m. and was eager to get home because later in the night he had a date scheduled. As he was driving home, a vehicle behind him indicates that they wanted to purchase some goods, so he pulls into a driveway to engage with this customer. Unfortunately, it's a setup. He said that he somebody had tried to pull him over for ice cream. They had given him the brights, um, and he pulled over, and a uh, light-skinned black female approached the truck, asked for soda. He turned around to tell her what he had in the truck, and then when he turned back around, there was two masked um, gunmen. You said they flicked their lights. What do you mean by that? Like they're brights, they're hazard lights, or bright lights. And is that a sign um, to if you somebody's as being... motioning for you to pull over, you know, somebody was behind you and they kept flicking the lights to get your attention. Okay. Is that a common practice for individuals um, who want to get the attention of an ice cream truck driver to pull over? Is that something that you've had experience with? I don't know if it's a common practice, but yes, it's happened to me before. Okay. He noticed the car that had pulled up behind him, honking the horn. Uh, so he stopped thinking they wanted to buy some ice cream. He stated that a uh, a light-skinned black female, very well dressed, got out and asked him how much was a soda. So he told him that at that time, he noticed that a black male had gotten into his truck, armed with a, uh, a weapon, 
covered, uh, face was covered, and had on knit gloves. Uh, didn't notice another black male, and he, he also had the gun, also had his face covered, wearing knit gloves. Uh, he asked him not to steal his truck. He said, we're not there to steal your truck. Uh, they, uh, one of them, the black male, shot him, and then, then they fled. There was an ice cream truck in the driveway, um, and in the driver's seat there was a male who had been shot, and there was some blood throughout the uh, various spots within the, uh, the ice cream truck. Was he bleeding at that time? Yes. Did you, um, what did you do when you got there? Uh, I went to give first aid and secure the scene. Uh, fire rescue arrived maybe about a minute after man took over first aid. Um, so I, did, I really didn't get very close look at any of his injuries. Michael was shot a total of five times. Two in the left chest area, one time in the upper left leg, once in his left hand, and once in the right arm. The injuries to his right arm destroyed bones, tendons, and his radial nerve, which rendered him unable to move his hand or fingers properly. He required physical therapy to learn how to walk again, and bones in his left hand had been severely shattered. Over the course of the next few months, Michael would undergo multiple surgeries, which saw rods implanted into his arm, bone transfers from other parts of his body, and tendon repairs. He had a lot of trouble with general living due to the injuries. He's unable to clean himself after using the restroom, unable to use a knife and fork to eat, and many other daily activities become impossible for him to perform on his own. Michael moves back in with his parents, where he lives in a makeshift bedroom that had been set up next to the kitchen. The following months would see Michael frequently checking in with law enforcement to ask how the investigation was progressing and if they had found the people that did this to him. Police were having a lot of trouble locating any sort of proper leads, and Michael would become increasingly frustrated due to this. Taking matters into his own hands, Michael begins to conduct his own investigation of sorts. And to start, whilst on ice cream runs, he questions people in the community where the incident occurred to find out if there's any word on the street regarding who had shot him. As he was recovering still, and fearful for his life, he enlists the help of his friend, David Beckwith, to join him on these routes. David, at the time, needed work and was more than happy to join his buddy on these runs. Michael would drive, and David would sell, and they would split the day's earnings 50-50. During his time working on the truck, David recalls multiple occasions where Michael had aggressively questioned customers regarding the shooting. There was one other incident that happened in, uh, by, by, out by Ocean Mist where uh, um, this, this guy, I guess, that they knew, he said that uh, he, he was saying that I think your son was involved in shooting me. I told him why he's accusing me of shooting him. Um, where was um, the ice cream truck man at that time? It was in the front seat. Of his ice cream van? Yes. Did he respond? Yes, he kept on pointing at me that I did it, I did it. Um, and when he was saying that you did it, you did it, uh, did he say anything else? We started, I started getting frustrated. He started saying cuss words. Did he continue to accuse you of shooting him when you denied doing it? Yes. Um, did he make any movements or anything like that? He kind of got up in the front seat and started pointing towards his forearm, and I didn't pay attention to that. Did you remain there or um, at the ice cream truck, or at some point did you walk away? I walked away. What was the ice cream truck's man's demeanor when you started to walk away? He started cussing at me. What did he say to you? Can I say that word? Relevance. No rule, that was that. He said, fuck you, you're an asshole, you're a dick, and... I just started walking away even faster. Was there a back and forth exchange between them? Yes. Did it get heated? Uh, somewhat heated. Okay. Ultimately, did the defendant ask questions about the son being involved? Yes, he asked the son actually, and uh, the son replied and said, if, I, if it was me that would have shot you, you would be standing here. Is this during the time that you're working on the ice cream truck with him? Yes, this is happening when, when I'm on the truck, and it, it happened quite a bit. It, a lot of it, I just kind of let it go because it's bullshit. Okay. 
Okay. I'm sorry. Was there? You're fine. Was there, and let's try not to cuss. Was there a time when you specifically recall an interaction with a younger girl? Yes. Tell me about That's that. That's the one that sticks out in my head the most because he really upset that little girl. So tell and me about that. I felt that was wrong. Um, if we were uh, down in uh, in Ruskin at these, um, I, I don't know how to explain them, um, subsidized apartments. Okay. Um, there's a little girl that watches a lot of kids in the neighborhood, I guess, while they're in the pool area by the uh, apartments. Had you seen her before? Um, once or twice before this. Okay. Um, I didn't see her after this, uh, the, after the incident that happened. That, uh, Mike, Mike asked her if she had a little, if she had a sister, an older sister, and she said yes. And he wanted to see a picture of her, and she didn't know if she had a picture. And then he starts getting irritated when she didn't show it right away and she kept asking why he wanted to see a picture. <coughs> did he tell this girl why he wanted to see a picture of her? Yes, he did. What did he say? He said that he, he thinks that his, uh, her sister was involved in shooting him. Did that girl ever show a picture? Reluctantly, yes. And did he say anything that you heard after he saw that picture? That, yeah, oh, that's not her. Okay. He got that little girl upset for no reason, and it was bad. It was wrong. Over time, Michael learns from people in the community that quite possibly a man who goes by the nickname Creeper was potentially involved in his shooting. Once learning this information, Michael questions multiple people about whether they know of this mysterious Creeper character. Tell me why and when you hear the name Creeper. Um, why? Because he believes that what, um, he's the guy that shot him. The name came up quite a bit. He asked if I knew anybody named Creeper. Who was he looking for? Somebody by the name of Creep or Creeper. Okay. He had told me to keep my eyes open for a Mexican guy with a tattoo that said Creeper. He said he was looking for someone named Creeper. Did he ever bring up the name Creeper to you? Yes. He would ask if I knew... Uh, who Creeper was, if, you know, if I could find out where Creeper lived or where he hanged out or who he really was, you know, um, you know, I didn't know who Creeper was, you know. It was brought up a lot. Over time, after learning more and more about Creeper, Michael contacts authorities with this information and tells them that he might have been mistaken in his initial description that the robbers were black males and that he now believes them to be Hispanic. Although police take this information on board, they are still unable to locate the individuals who robbed him, only furthering Michael's frustrations regarding how the investigation was going. Did he talk to you at all about his feelings about law enforcement's investigation regarding that? Yeah, he was very frustrated that they weren't listening to him and... Yeah, he was very frustrated that they weren't listening to him. He felt that they weren't listening to him and they weren't doing anything about information, I guess, that he was getting. During ice cream runs that David did with Michael, the two would have many discussions regarding the robbery, and David would express his anger that the people who had shot Michael were never brought to justice. The two have extensive conversations regarding a plan that they would execute should they ever properly find out the identity of Michael's attackers. Mr. Beckwith, were you aware if the defendant was looking for um, cop uniforms or law enforcement uniforms? Yes. Did you all discuss that? Yeah. He said he actually had some already ordered. Well, I mean, his plan was to be a cop, yeah. Okay, so tell me about that. Um. He wanted to, he was going to buy a Crown Victoria and dress up like a police officer. And How do you know? He told me. How many times? More than once. More than twice? More than twice. More than three times? Was on the truck with him for a while. Did the defendant ever say anything specifically about what he wanted to do if he was going to dress up like a cop? Yeah, take him and kidnap him, basically. Make him disappear. You said basically, so do you remember his exact words? No. It's been so long. Sure. Do you remember the gist or the basics of what he was saying to you? Yes. Okay. Back in 2010, 
Were you willing to help the defendant? I was. What does that mean? I was willing to help him find him. And if the, if justice didn't prevail, then yeah, I would have helped him probably make him disappear. Before any of these plans to dress up as cops and find the assailants could make any progress, Michael and David would have an argument which ended their friendship. Did things end poorly between you and Michael Keatley on the ice cream truck? Yeah. Is that yeah, kind of little by little every day he would show his true colors? And well, let me. No, no, I don't want to talk about leading up to it. Did you pull a gun on him? Yes, I did. Okay, so we can get to things end poorly because you pulled a gun on him. <clears throat> Tell me about that. Well, I kind of felt like you know. <clears throat> he's already been shot up once and, and uh, we were in a, a situation where it was a place where we could get picked off. You know, and we're not going in nice neighborhoods. Do you remember the name of the road that you were on? Um, Stevens Road? Stevens. Okay. Stevens kind of a one way in, one way out? Yeah. Were you comfortable in that neighborhood? No. Did you tell that to the Yes, I did. He thought it was funny. How'd that make you feel? Um, very irate. Alright. Was there further discussions between you and the defendant about how you felt going down Stevens Road? Um, there wasn't discussions more than berating name callings and making, making me feel little. Alright. Didn't take kindly to that? No, I did not. What'd you do? I told him to let me out, drop me off the truck, stop the truck right now. Did he? No. What'd you do? Well, I put the gun to his head. Where? To his temple. Right. What was the defendant doing at this point? Was he driving the truck? Yes. Okay. Does he stop? Yes. What do you do? I get out of the truck. What do you do with the gun? He, he made a comment about him. I've got to take his gun too. And I took and chambered it. And I, I threw the clip at him and then I threw the gun at him. Which gun did you use? The 45. When you got off that ice cream truck, did you have that 45 caliber firearm with you? No. Where was it? Thrown at him, inside the truck. Was that the last day you worked? That was the last day I worked for him. This brings us to the date, November 25th, 2010, Thanksgiving night. The man named Creeper's real name is Omar Baylon. Omar lives in a street called Ocean Mist, and on this night, a few houses down from where he resides, at 604 Ocean Mist Court, there's a small party happening where a group of his friends are getting together to celebrate. Omar was not at this party, but there was around 10 others all hanging out on the porch. What were y'all doing on the porch? We were playing cards and drinking. At some point um, during that time period, you said that you guys have purchased an 18 pack of Corona, is that correct? Yes. And also some cigars. Yes. At some point during that time when you're hanging out on the porch on Ocean Mist, did you and some of your friends drink the beer? Yes. And what about the cigars? Were they used for anything? Uh, they rolled marijuana into them. The 18 pack of Corona, who was drinking that? Me, Sergio, and Jose Rodriguez. At some point, did another person show up to hang out with you all there on the porch at 604 Ocean Mist Court. Yes, ma'am. Who was that? Uh, Daniel Beltran. When I got there, it was um, Jose Rodriguez, Sergio Witron, Gonzalo Guevara was there, and Walter and Diego were there, which they lived there. Jose Rodriguez lived there as well. Um, but then Walter and Diego went inside like a little later, but I, I was there when I, when I got there, they were still there. What kind of drinks were you all drinking that night? Drinking Corona beers. Do you need a minute or are you okay to move on? Okay. If Eat you need a water. break, just let me know. Um, okay. Would you like a glass of water? Okay. So, right. Were there any drugs involved? Yes. Okay. And what drugs um, were there at this party or get together? Marijuana and cocaine. Was everyone um, drinking there on the porch? Yes. Was everyone taking part in the drug usage? Uh, no, some of them were. Okay. My back was towards the like, the arch, right, right in the middle of that. 
So was your back facing the road or facing the home? Yes, facing the road. My back facing the road. So yes. were you and the chair closest to the corner of the porch or over closest to the stairs? Do you recall? Over closer to the stairs. To the stairs. Yes. At some point, did some other individuals arrive? Yes. And who else arrived? Um, it was Raymond. Raymond Gallen arrived there with Juan Witron and Richard Cantu. He got there. At some point, is your attention drawn to the road? Yes. Um, I don't know, about 2 in the morning, something around there. Um, I'm very conservative. Like I like to see my surroundings, and uh, you know, every once in a while. So I was looking around. One time, I look around, and I see some um, headlights of a car coming around. This is a mini a minivan. Okay. And you remember the color of the vehicle? I think it was a dark colored vehicle. Tell us what happened and where. When did you first notice it, and what did it do? Just seeing it pass by. So I looked over my left shoulder. So I seen some lights coming out from the road because it's right where the house is at. It's a loop, so that's where the the, the the loop goes around there. So I seen the lights coming out, and I looked over and I told them that there there's a car coming, and there's usually no car there because it's a loop. It doesn't no nobody goes in there unless you live there, and I must have turned right back around because I didn't go about two minutes or. I managed to fit. I seen the lights again. Now I seen them on my left, on my right side, because I had already turned around back to the table, and I seen the lights come again. And I told my friends again, I said, "Hey, look, that same car's coming back again." After it stopped, what did you see? I seen an individual get off. Right. And was how many people was it? Was it just one individual or more than one? Just one. Just one. And where did that individual go? He walked towards the front of the porch. Are you still in that chair facing in that direction towards the roadway, towards yes, the front of the porch? At some point, could you see that individual's face? Yes. Let me ask you this. Do you remember what he was wearing? Yeah, he was wearing a black shirt. Did you notice anything else about his black shirt? Yeah, it had a lettering on it. It said sheriff on it. As soon as he turned around to close the door, I see on the front it says sheriff. And it had a badge like hanging, like, like wolves, dude. You know, like, it's cops, like, you know. so I had whatever little weed that I had, marijuana, and I put it under the table. And then when I turned around after putting the stuff on, I'm not exactly what they were doing. Um, and then when I finished putting my stuff away, I turned around, and I got up to the red link, and we all stood there, and he was already like, um, under the steps already it's just standing there with a rifle. let me just let me just stop you for a minute do you get up from the seat that you're sitting in yes and you said that he had um, something in his hand is that correct uh, yes the what did he have in his hand he had a rifle did that person when he approached the porch did he say anything <laughs> he's asking for creeper he asked who's creeper they would tell him that he, um, he was not there, and like, okay, well, where's he at? And he started, like, the second question, it was more, like, demanding us, like, where's he at? And like, well, Did you believe this was a law enforcement officer at this time? Uh, yes. At some point, is he telling you or giving you orders to you and your friends what to do? Uh, he shot in the air, and then he ordered us to get our IDs out and get on our knees. What was Juan Guitron doing at that time? Uh, well, I looked at Gonzalo and we looked at each other and I uh, like, just, you know, like, hey, let's just do what he says. He's a law enforcement, like, you know, just show him our IDs, go and check. We ain't, we ain't who he's looking for. He'll get out of here. We'll keep playing or whatever. And, you know, and go do what he said, get on the ground, get our IDs out. And me and Gonzalo went to stand and everybody kind of follow along. I said Juan. Juan stayed standing right there on the, by the steps. Did you know where Juan's ID was at that point? No. Okay. He said where it was at. He said he said it was in his car. Um, if he can go and get it, and the guy's like, "No, just get in the ground." I was like, "Well, why you want me to get in the ground if I don't have my ID?" And like, and like, get in the fucking ground. 
and then one say chill out. He started shooting at him. Just take a minute, okay? <clears throat> When he shot uh, Juan, I thought it was like beanbags or something just because he didn't quarter. Like, he ain't doing what he's telling him, so I'm getting the ground. And, and he just telling him, like, talking back with him. And um, he shot him, and I'm thinking still in my head, and I'm like, and no way, man. I was like, that's what, like, I was kind of like saying to myself, like, that's what you get for not listening to him. But you said I was beanbags? Yeah, I was thinking he shot him with bean bags, like just to mount real bullets and kill them, but like just to like calm him down because Juan was not cooperating with him. Richard was looking for his ID. And just walking toward Richard and put the gun on his head and just like Richard felt it. <laughs> Then we tripped. Take some deep breaths. Get you some water. You shot Richard. Where did he shoot Richard? In the head. Did you see that? Yes, ma'am. And that went from once from the bottom of the head, and then I seen the big hole come out of his head, and it landed all in my face because he was corner next to me. I looked at him, and like he had a big hole in his head, just a lot of blood was coming out of his head, and everything was just getting piled up. And he shook like two or three times, like like his body was shivering, and just shaking, dying around, and, and then he stopped. He just didn't move anymore. He stayed still. I kind of turn around so that you know he don't look at me and shoot. And then I hear one more gunshot. It was one, just one single one. Then he shot me. Where did you get shot? He shot me in my left hand. Um, were you holding anything in your left hand at the time when you got shot? My ID. And why were you holding your ID? Because that's what he told us to do. I heard two more, and I still didn't want her to turn around. And then I heard him. I heard him walking like behind me, or like getting closer. And I looked a little bit, and then, and I tried to grab my bottom, the beer bottle that was in front of me. And the the beer bottle just fell, and it was rolling, rolling and moving. And I grabbed it, tried to get up to hit him with the bottle. And he see me moving and he turned around and he just shot me in my hip. And I fell straight forward with the force of the bullet. I just went, I fell straight forward. My whole side of my whole leg, it was just numb. And, and he walked up, he walked up to me, put his one leg on top of me, like, and tried to like kick me or something. I remember I was like, get off. So I get off of me and get the freak off of me and, and he tried to aim at my head and I was just moving everywhere and he just walked off of me because I was just moving everywhere around and he walked off of, away from me and he was aiming at me and I started crawling as I'm going on in front of Gonzalo and Jose Rodriguez to try to get to the railing so I can get off the porch and just see if I can make it out of there. Um, he, I was going in front of them. He went behind them and went and stood right in front of me as I was getting to the railing. And I looked, I seen his feet and I looked up and I looked up. He looked down at me and he, he shot me in my chest. And then I fell off the porch. I looked over and I seen him look over the, lay, the railing to see if I was, I guess, dead or alive. And, uh, I looked at him and he looked at me again and I seen him get just pointing at me. I turned around to to keep crawling away from there and then he shot me again on my back. 
the moment he shot me, it was instantly I started like, it just it hit me, shook my body, and then it just started like burning real bad, and I just started throwing up a lot of blood and like pieces of liver. Uh, blood just started coming out of my nose. <laughs> <laughs> Did you continue to hear more gunshots at that point? Yeah, he, he looked over at me again and to see if I was dead. And I looked back at him again. He still he, he pointed at me, shot again, and it hit me the ear. Hit me my ear and on my. But it just grazed. <laughs> um, when he shot, when he grazed me here, they shot me in the face, um, the ear. Uh, the, the force still threw me down, and I hit the ground again, and I didn't want to get up anymore. Um, not, but I, I heard him again, and I seen him. He was trying to point at me again. Uh, so I just got bent the curve on the trailer. And I went to the back. I just kept on dragging to the back. I made it to the back of the house. I got to the fence. Daniel manages to throw his body over the fence using a chair to pull himself up. He lays here for a bit, and as he does so, he hears more gunshots. They eventually stop, and the shooter flees the location. Very quickly, first responders arrive on scene. I went to uh, approach the porch. Um, and I saw that there were several victims. Uh, based on what I was seeing, I, I actually started to physically count. Um, and I counted four what appeared to be victims of gunshot wounds on the porch, and then another just inside the front door. And I relayed this information to dispatch so we could get additional medical units en route. There was a large amount of, uh, there was blood on the ground. Um, Everybody was screaming in pain. Uh, it was very chaotic. From my understanding, uh, they had been shot with like a shotgun or something similar. Did they say by who? Um, someone dressed in a police costume. Were you taken um, to the hospital by medical? Um, the helicopter came and picked me, yes. When you get shot, where are you shot? Uh, came through my arm and then went through my side, came all the way out. Uh, I remember laying down, and then um, I heard a couple of footsteps, a couple more shots, and I mean, I, I was pretty fast, and I, next thing I know, I woke up, and the um, paramedics and cops were on the scene already. How many times did you get sh shot? Total four times. Where did you get shot? My left hand, top of my chest, my torso area around this area and right on top of my butt on the left hand side. Do you remember after that first shot to your hand, do you remember getting those other shots? No, ma'am. And I'm gonna ask you <clears throat> about Thanksgiving, November 25th of 2010. Do you have any memory of that day? No. Did you um, receive a gunshot wound on that day? Yes. Can you tell us where that injury is? Can you point to it? Yeah, right where there it and then Right there. And you're pointing to the left side of your head, is that yeah. correct? Okay. And I'm just going to approach you briefly. Um, okay. Can you tell us where both the, do you still have scars right there and you're yeah, pointing yeah. to the front and then also to the yeah. back? Okay. Juan and Sergio Guitron, brothers, both died from their wounds, with Sergio passing whilst in surgery at hospital. Surviving victims all undergo multiple surgeries for life-threatening injuries and they spend months in hospital. Between surgeries and when conscious, they are approached by detectives in hospital, and although some have lapses in memory, most of them do remember what the shooter looked like, and a description is provided that matches up with each other's memory. Included with this, they all remember the gunman asking for Creeper. Further investigation occurs the very day of the shooting, and this sees police question people of the community regarding who they thought could be involved. This very quickly uncovers that Michael Keatley may be a possible suspect, 
As they learn, he had been actively searching for Creeper. A photo set is brought to the surviving witnesses whilst they are still in hospital, and Michael Keatley is ID'd as the man who shot them. Michael is picked up by a detective the day after the shooting and taken to the station for questioning. Video of the interview was not recorded, but there was an audio device being used to document the exchange. Today's date is uh, November 27, 2010. The time is uh, 2200 hours. Um, I know we've been talking for a little while. Um, when we started talking, uh, you to your rights. Um, you said you understood all your rights. Right. Did you have any questions about your rights? No. No. Okay. And then yeah. also, I want to talk to you about um, an incident that happened on Thanksgiving morning. Okay. Um, that happened right here in Ruskin. First of all, can you tell me about what happened with you guys? I was running my truck, and uh, this car came up behind me, and they beeped the horn. It just got dark, and this girl came up to the window, and um, you yeah, know she's. You know, talking to me like we had to drink, blah blah. blah. I kept kind of distracting me and stuff, and and then next thing I know, these two guys come up, and then I had a gun on the face, and then another guy came and got into the truck, and um, they just kind of like stood there and I was like, look, well, like, you know, I'll take whatever you want, you know, I don't care. And he goes to the thigh, and I said, here's some money that I have because I just filled up and I had some, you know, money in my shirt. I said, here you go, just take it, you know, and. Um, and then uh, um, he goes, come here, and he grabbed me, and he turned me around, and when I did like this, he was going to shoot me in the back of the head. And um, so I pulled back away from him, and I went to the back of the truck, and I said, look, you don't have to do this. I said, because you guys wear a mask, well, I don't even know who you are. You know, I said, and for a few bucks, I said, I really don't care. I was like, just go, you know. And Did they take your money? Yeah, yeah, they took my money, but they didn't really act like they cared about it, you know. How much money did they take? like 12 bucks. 12 bucks, 12 bucks yeah. Okay. And, um, you know, and they just kind of looked at each other and just sit in, and they just started shooting me. How many times you got? Five. Five times. Five. They shot till they ran out of bullets. Let me ask you this. Did you go anywhere Wednesday night? Wednesday night? Um, yeah, I was home by, shoot, 12.30. 12.30? Yeah, 12 Where did you go? So. Um, went to a, um, um, it was a party down in, in um, Palmetto. But I don't really know the guy. I, I just followed some other people down there. So I was doing karaoke. I didn't really know nobody, so I came home. And when you got home, mom and dad were home? Yeah. Okay. Did you go anywhere else then? No. You just went to bed now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And next morning you got up and went to bed? We got up and then we went to see my sisters. You went to your sisters? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let me ask you this. At any point, did you get any information about a male by the name of Creeper? or the street name by the name of Creeper, um, somebody that could be related to your um, case. No, no, kid. There was somebody named, named Jesse and a kid named Bubba. Jesse and Bubba. Jesse and Bubba. What car did you drive before you? Uh, my mom and dad's name. Is that the one that you had tonight? Yeah. That's uh, the blue one. Blue and silver. Okay. But the only names that you heard people on the street giving you information about your incident was right. Jesse and Buff. Yeah. You never heard about a guy by the name of Creeper? No. Never. Okay. No. So you never asked anybody about a guy by the name of Creeper? No. Okay. No. That name never came up one No. You're all in investigation. No. 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 It's, a, it's um. Like I said, the only person we heard was a Jesse and a kid named Bubba. Okay. You know, so um, that's really about it. Man. Um, and I told you your name would come up in this investigation roughly the shooting, right? Bye. 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 Um, a couple things um, caused your name to, to come up. Okay. Um, there were there were six people shot. Okay. Um, two of them have passed. Okay. Okay. Um, one of the subjects there, um, who was with the other six, uh, was there, was not shot. Okay. But he was a witness. Okay. okay. And uh, I'll be I'll be completely honest with you, Mike. He um, he described you to a T. Okay. He described you to a T, and he described the uh, the van um, that came to the scene. 
and left the scene. I've also made contact with, with numerous people. You have to understand we've been working this since Thanksgiving. Okay. The people we've made contact with um, have said that you've made it very clear over the last few weeks in the last couple of months that you were looking for a subject by the name of Creep and you felt he was responsible for the shooting. The um, previous shooting that you, that, uh, where you were shot. Right, was shot, okay. Right. Right. They were very clear that uh, you told them point blank that you felt Creep is responsible and that uh, you also asked them if they can find him and bring him to you, you would give them a reward for it. Um, so yeah, I told anybody that if they call, if they just call it in, that there's a reward. But it's been months, man, since since I I've even even dealt with talking to people anymore because nobody wants to talk, man. You know, like I said, that was that had to be six months ago. Well, you know, the like, was, people that are hoodlums. Yeah, they're they're, they're not the people that was like six months ago. So it's not like oh, I've been down there three weeks, like you said, because. It's been six months or so. And I just gave up. People that would say, "Oh, I, I know somebody," and then I told, I called a detective, mm -hmm. and then they would nobody would talk. Would you agree to this tonight, though? Would you agree that over the last couple of weeks you have talked to a few people and you have told them that you think Creep is responsible for, um, for the shooting? I don't know that name. I've never heard that name. <clears throat> have you ever? whether it be out of anger or frustration or anything else, uh, ask somebody, look, if you know anybody that, you know, something to the effect of if you know somebody that was involved with the, my shooting, uh, bring them to me. Let me ask you that. I mean, like I said, I mean, uh, do, do I wish that the people that shot me get, would, would, would die a horrible death? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. And, you know, but like I said, but I, I, I will only want the people that did it to me, not a dozen people, or, or you know what I'm saying, or, or I, just the people that did it to me. How many people were involved in your shooting? Um, there were two guys and a girl. Two guys and a girl. Yeah. Okay. We can't get around the fact that a surviving witness um, described you to a T, including your van. Yeah, I, you know what? Uh, bullshit. That's not what I'm going to tell you right now. I promise you. I'm telling you right now that, that, that there's, they did not describe that van. They described you to a T. <laughs> then you're looking for the wrong guy, bro, because it wasn't me. I understand that you want this to go away, Mike. I'm telling you right now, man. I mean, it, I'm sorry. It just it isn't, man. And what do I do? Hobble over there and freaking shoot him left-handed? I'm only going to tell you stuff that I know to be I true, Mike. Really, I don't recall any fucking dude named Creeper. You know what? If they think I did it, like I said, I'll well, prove it then because I didn't do it. You know? We can prove it. If you, we wouldn't be here if we couldn't. Right? You know what? You, know what you can do it. Do it. But I don't, I don't want, want to do it that way. Yeah, well, you don't want to do it that way because I'm saying you don't have to do it that way. Come on. Here's the deal. You got to be remorseful if you went out and did something. Me? You know what? Not everybody's remorseful what they did, but so. Not everybody's remorseful for what they did. That's what I'm asking you. Yeah, like I said, I hated, I hated those people in the beginning for what they did to me. And I really did. And, and, and you know what? And my God, I would love to have seen these people dead. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and find out later that they were the ones that were, were responsible. I would have loved that, you know? We're going to have to do what we have to do, right? Okay. David, you're not presenting the case, see? Did you have your cell phone with you? Yeah, yeah, I'm cell phone. Okay. Did you have your... When you came home, you had your cell phone with you? Yeah. yeah. So when you woke up in the morning, you still had your cell phone? Yeah. So you have to know in your head that if you weren't at that place that you said you were, then we're going to know that. Oh, absolutely. Exactly. That's not what it says, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what it is. You know what? I mean, that is my You gotta realize what I'm telling you, man. David, 
you, you, you can't lie to me. <laughs> when you tell me this, and I know it's freaking bullshit, because you cannot put somebody somewhere when they know they weren't there. Right. You just can't do it, dude. I don't think you... I mean, if you saw me try to handle a gun, you, you, we wouldn't even be having this talk right now, because you would just freaking laugh. You would just be like, all right, dude, I don't even want to talk to you. Dude, I was going to spend my fucking life in prison over a bunch of pieces of shit. You know what I'm saying? To me, I, no. What little bit I have, what little bit of my hand I have now, is a lot better out here than I ain't fucking going away over some piece of shit or bag. Like I said, those people, you know what? I'll shake that guy's hand that did that. Because to me, that's a fucking hero that went over there. Now, whether they were involved, they're not, you know what? Most of them are freaking gangbangers over on the street anyways. You're right, they all are dirty. You know, so ain't none of them worth a shit. You're right. You know, so, like I said, now, you know, and if that's the case and that's all that they were, then, you know what? I'd shake that guy's hand out. He just went over there and just started freaking just whacking people like, you know what I'm saying? That, there's no like a little kid or something like that, right. you know, then I'd be like, hey, you know what, that wasn't right. There's no innocent people who got shot. Yeah, that I can tell you. So. At that point, I was trying to relate to a defendant, and I felt like if I told him that these were completely innocent people, um, minding their own business, enjoying each other's company, preparing for the holiday, that would have made him feel more defensive and not open up with me. So I tried to relate to him that I understand you know, he I think he referred to him as shitbags or something. So I kind of just agreed with what he was saying to try to create that bond with him. That's the case. You know what? I'll shake the guy's hand. And if you do catch him, dude, I'll raise money for his bail. You know? And, 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 and I'll tell you honestly, like, I wish that more people would do it. The detectives go back and forth with Michael for quite some time, and he is eventually released. It is discovered by analyzing bullets found at the crime scene that the weapon in question would have been something that can fire 45s. A search warrant is obtained for Michael's residence, and multiple guns are found, but none that fire these sort of bullets. What is located in his home, though, are magazines and ammunition that is the same sort used in the shooting. Police begin to question more and more people who know Michael, and there are multiple reports that these people have not only heard that Michael owns the sort of weapon used in the incident, but some have also gone out with him target shooting in the months leading up to Thanksgiving. In these instances, these people would say they noticed he was able to fire the weapon in question using his left hand with minimal issue. The gun was a Glock firearm. One person who reported on Michael's ability to shoot was another one of his ex-girlfriends. Norma Jean Towers, a woman who dated Michael in the months leading up to Thanksgiving. She would provide statement regarding his ability to use a gun, and also how he was progressing well with his healing. She says he was able to walk with no noticeable limp, and he could perform a range of tasks using his hands, such as feeding baby cows with large bottles of milk, and firing larger weapons such as rifles. Now, going back to 2008 and 2010, did you have a favorite hobby that you engaged in? Yes. What was that? Singing, karaoke. Was that something that you did on a regular basis? Yes, ma'am. How often would you do that? Whenever I had free time. And where did you do engage in that sort of activity? What sort of places did you go to to do karaoke? Uh, family restaurants, cherries, um, salutes, incognitos. Alpha Pizzeria. Did you know a person or come to know a person named Michael Keatley? Yes. Now going back to 2008 and 2009, were there occasions where he would also come and do karaoke at some of the places that you did karaoke? Yes. During that time period, did you really know him? No. Did you engage in conversations with him during that time period? Mm -hmm very little at some point in 2010 did you see um, the person known as Michael Keatley at one of those karaoke places yes I do was there something that drew your attention to him during that time period in 2010 the welcoming that he got when he walked in from the KJ when he walked through the door uh, the KJ recognized him right away and then announced that 50 cent had just walked in and he started playing the sound of gunfire. And what's a KJ? A KJ is a karaoke DJ. 
Did you know what that reference alluded to? Mm. I don't understand your question. When you said that he was introduced. To oh, yes, sense. yes. Uh, well, I asked someone sitting next to me what that was in reference to, and they explained that he had gotten shot. How would you describe his appearance on that night? He was well kept, um, hair combed. He looked like, like he gained weight, well dressed. Um, he looked different. And you, when you say he looked different, what time period are you referring to that his appearance had changed, that from, he looked different? From the first time that I met him, he was unkept, and his hair was messy, and he looked like sloppy. And During that time period, when you are meeting up with him at these different karaoke places, did you ever notice or take note of any sort of limp that he had when he walked? No, I never noticed a limp. Did you notice anything with his hands, any sort of issue or awkwardness that he had with any of his hands? No. Approximately how many times would you say that you had been to the defendant's home? Uh, probably about two or three times in a week. But sometimes right after work, I'd still have my scrubs on and go ahead and go visit. What would you do when you would go over to his residence? Um, the first time um, there was like target practice, he was doing target practice. Now when you say target practice, is that, what do you mean by that? Um, he had a gun, or maybe a few, I'm not sure, but um, he was shooting at some cars that were in the, um, in the field. Did you go to a gun show yes. with the defendant yes. in 2010? Yes. During that time period in the summer? Yes. And what did he purchase at that gun show? It's so. Ma'am, and I apologize. You're fine, but just wait till she, because the court reporter can't take, but just wait till she finishes the question before you answer. It's okay. It's all right. New Yorker. And do you remember um, what he purchased at the gun show? He bought a Tommy gun round thing, like a cartridge where bullets go in, and it attaches to uh, a gun. Uh, he wanted to try it out. And so uh, he, he said, if I wanted to, I can watch him. He's going to go outside. So I followed him out. And what did he do? He went out with the, with the rifle. He leaned up against the wall. And then he was, I was like, don't you think it's kind of loud? And he said, no, it's, it's OK. And then he started shooting upwards, up into the sky. And was he able to fire that rifle? Yeah, it was really loud. Uh, one night, he or one day, maybe, I'm, I'm not sure what time of the day it was, but um, he wanted to go into a particular neighborhood and uh, ride around and have me write down tag numbers on his head. He had one of those hunter hats or maybe a mosquito net type hat, something where you have complete coverage over your face and the, the neck area and... Um, that, that's what he was wearing. Do you remember if it was dark or light out? It was light. It was light enough. Were there people out in the neighborhood when you all were doing that? Yes. Did you have your face covered in any way? No. Were you concerned at the time when you guys were doing this? Very. And what was your concern? My concern was is that he was disguised and that made me nervous and also that I was like a sitting duck. That everyone could see my car and the woman that was sitting in the passenger seat. That was my main concern. I was very upset. The search conducted in Michael's residence would also uncover another interesting article of evidence. Located in the house is a journal, and inside this journal that contained his fingerprints is written the home address of Omar Baylon, the one known as Creeper, 507 Ocean Mist Court the house only a few doors down from where the Thanksgiving shooting took place. Furthermore, there are details of other people who lived in this house with Omar. Another eyebrow-raising detail that the investigation uncovers is on the very next day following the shooting, Michael had gone over to his friend's house to respray his dark-coloured minivan, the one that he often drove around in. The van's colour is changed from a complete dark blue to a two-tone lower half of the vehicle being a sort of grey, goldish colour. There was also something else strange about how he organised this meetup. Michael didn't call his friend from his cell phone like usual, 
and instead contacted him from an unknown number. Whilst he was at his friend's house, he would refuse to use his phone, at one point even asking to be driven to a nearby service station to make a call. I must say that during this testimony, I did find myself having the slightest chuckle because at times it seemed as though the witness, Henry Bose, felt as though he was the one on trial for the quality of his paint job. States Exhibit 181, again, that's the front portion of yeah, the Yeah, now band. you look at the collar, it matches the interior pretty much. Okay, which is a sandstone, beige, camel, whatever you want to call it. Okay, and so again, prior to painting this, the lower half of the vehicle, it was all blue, correct? Yes, now you look sides, blue side of it. Okay. And right now, in this photograph, it's two-tone, is that correct? Yes. And so you painted this part of the vehicle, it's the lower part of the vehicle, is that correct? Yes. And you painted all of this, um, the lower portion yes, of the, the vehicle? The complete bottom, yes. Okay. Prior to that, that was all navy blue? Yeah, both sides, bumper to bumper. Located on the hard drive of Michael's computer are a range of photos and documents which caused concern for the detectives. He would have photos of guns, and more specifically, information related to the modification kit of a Glock pistol, a barrel extension that allows the weapon to fire the sort of projectiles found at the scene of the crime. If a Glock had this attachment, in the dark of night, it could have made the gun look like the short barrel shotgun or small rifle, which was described by surviving witnesses. They also find multiple photos, documents, articles, and arrest reports, all related to a number of Hispanic males that live in the Ocean Mist area. Pages upon pages of information relating to these people, what they were charged with, and in some instances, where they lived. Upon doing a search for words found on his computer, the word creeper would come up 185 times, Ocean Mist 92 times, 497 hits for the word silencer, 11,000 hits for the name Omar, around 2,000 hits for the word Glock, and 4,000 hits for the word Uniform. Although these numbers don't reflect how many times he may have typed or searched for those words, it does indicate that they were present somewhere on the computer, and it gives the detectives more of a reason to believe that he had lied when he said he had never heard of Creeper, and it all round adds to a pile of evidence growing against Michael. The bullets from the crime scene were analysed by an expert, and it is deemed that all were fired from the same weapon. There are some projectiles and casings that were recovered from the target shooting area at Michael's property, a spot on his land where he would fire at old cars to test out his weapons. And this is the area where a handful of witnesses say they saw Michael shooting the Glock. The analysis of the bullets located at Michael's house indicate that the markings matched the ones from the crime scene, and therefore were fired from the same weapon. With all of this evidence stacking up, Michael is arrested and charged with murder and attempted murder. The legal battles behind the scenes of this case are lengthy and complicated, leading it to be the longest running case in the history of the state. As this happens, Michael sits in prison for almost 10 years before a trial takes place. The first trial would result in a hung jury, and the second is scheduled shortly after. The trial date is now set for June of 2022, and in this one, new evidence, a range of witness testimonies is submitted by the state, which was not included during the first trial. As the second trial takes place, the state would present all of the evidence that you've seen over the course of this video and more. They would argue that Michael was hell-bent on inflicting revenge on the people that shot him, and although he was still suffering mobility issues from his injuries, at the time of the Thanksgiving incident, he was in a position where he was able to drive, shoot a weapon using his left hand, and walk at a normal pace. They would also put a heavy emphasis on his lies to the police, that he knew nothing about a man named Creeper, and they highlight Michael's plan to dress up as an officer so that he could enforce his own style of justice. To back this up, there's testimony from his ex-girlfriend, who not only said she saw a police shirt in his house, but a photo is provided showing him wearing a police outfit on Halloween that year. The defense's case would largely rely on picking at the credibility of witnesses, either for purposes that they had a bone to pick with Michael, 
or for the fact that the survivors were in a state where they provided an inaccurate description of the shooter. You know you had at least four hits or bumps off the cocaine. Yes. And that's where you scoop it yeah, with the key. on a key, put it <coughs> up to your nose, and snort. Yeah. Now, the, uh, at this point in time, you've had at least ten beers. About. Right? At least almost half a case of beer you've had that night, right? Roughly, yeah. Okay. And you've had at least four bumps of cocaine, right? Right. Okay. And you've been cutting hair all day, yes? Yes. Before going out. Um, this event happens quickly, doesn't it? I mean, time-wise, yes, but in my mind, it took forever. Got it. But it's happening quick. It's unexpected, right? Unexpected, but I mean, like you're trying to make it sound like it went by real quick, but well, the whole sequence was took forever. And in the right hand is something that you've described as something like shiny, like a badge or something. There is some object in the right hand. Correct. Now you said there was a badge around the neck. Right. There was not a badge or badge-like wallet in a hand. Right. Okay. Anybody who says that, they are incorrect. Yes. When you get to Ocean Mist, you're going to drink beer, right? Possibly, yes. Well, you did. I did, So, but by that time was a thought. Yes, possibly I was going to drink some. I did, yes. Uh, you brought marijuana. Right. Uh, you brought enough for about four blunts. No. No? No. Okay. How, many, how much did you bring? I don't know. Maybe two. Okay. Well, you have testified in the past that you smoked two, maybe three blunts. Right. And you shared other marijuana, right? Right. So at least you yourself, you consumed two or three blunts. No, not myself. No. Not yourself? No. Okay. Are you sure about that? Yes. All in all, you were buzzed that night, right? Yes. Um, you felt the effect of the marijuana that you had smoked, right? To be so sure there was. And the cocaine you had smoked. Yes, yes. And, and the beers that you yes. Furthermore, the defense goes on to highlight a problem with identification paperwork. When the victim, Gonzalo Guevara, identified Michael in the photo set shown to him, there appears to have been an incorrect number written on the paperwork, which was later corrected. The defense says... This is cause for serious concern. They bring in an expert forensic document examiner to review the paperwork in question. This is uh, obviously an enlargement of the area on the photo identification uh, lineup instruction sheet that uh, deals with the alteration of, uh, of the numbers. On my left, you can see where I've, I've increased or decreased the contrast um, so that it's clear to see perhaps the downstroke of what appears to be a four and uh, the left side of the four and of course you have the terminal stroke. Even though the three that's been over is overwritten the four appears to be obviously much darker, actually microscopically and instrumentally there's no distinction in the ink. In other words, it's, a, it's the same ink or similar ink and similar or the same writing instrument. And what's occurred is a overriding at least twice. And you can see a little bit of that up in here. Now I'm going to ask you about right up here in this place where it says, viewing the lineup, I have identified, and there's a number there. What is written in this particular line? That's the number three. Okay. Is there another number there? Yeah. What's the other number that is right here? Four. Okay. I want you to explain to the jury... Um, why there are two numbers in this location. At some point when I'm filling out the form, I put the number four. Um, during the interview, I knew that the picture I showed him was number three, um, was the picture that he picked and that he signed. So I got confused. During the interview with him, he says his picture number three, so I fixed it. Instead of using the number four, I put the number three there and I put my initials next to it, so it can be documented. I changed that. Okay. What is that? That's an X. Okay. 
at some other time, have you mistaken that for something else? Yes. And what did you mistake that for? A four. Okay. As part of your um, showing of the photo pack, do you, as part of that procedure, are you also asked to record and document how sure they are of their identification? Yes, ma'am. Did you do this in this case? Yes. And how sure did Guevara Guevara say that he was as to the identification that he had made on December 1st of 2010? I think he said a thousand percent. I thought he said two thousand percent, but it was a thousand percent okay. is what he said. A number four is put in that particular blank. Yes. Who puts that number four there? I did. You did? Correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And then you've finished once Mr. Guevara signs it, right? So now you put that document in front of Mr. Guevara, right? Yes. And well, does he... Hold on. After I put the number there? Yeah, after you put the four? No, the four I did that afterwards, later. So all I did was give him the form and he signed it. Why I put the X. Why would you put the four? So you need to tell me that Mr. Guevara signed this document with I have identified number in a blank? It was blank and he signed it. So what is he signing then? He's signing that he has made an identification. I know that it's picture number three. And he also it's also the picture that he saw. What about Mr. Gravera? He's the one that is deciding which one he identified. And you're gonna leave that blank for him to sign? That is certainly not part of the SOPs, right? Um that was blank and he signed the picture that he picked. That was blank when he signed it. Yes. That is contrary to the procedures of the SOP. I would say so, I guess. I don't know. Do you see the writing there in the bottom? Yes, sir. See that right there? Yes, sir. You didn't write that for us. I did. That's an X. January 27, 2016. Remember the following questions and answers. Question. Do you see how the way that you write a number four looks the same as how Mr. Gravera writes the number four. Your answer, yes ma'am. Question, is that just a coincidence or are you sure you didn't write the number four beside Gonzalo Rivera on this photograph? Answer, I'm sure he wrote that, not me. You were under oath back then, right? Yes, sir. And you said that, right? Yes, sir. <clears throat> it's a four. No, that's an X, sir. Well, but under oath, back then, you said it was a four. A simple yes or no? Um, yes, I did. Based on that testimony, I was confused, so yes, that's what I said. You said, number one, that that's a, a four, and number two, that Mr. Rivera put the number four beside his signature, right? There's confusion, yes. It's got a three circled up on top here, right? Okay. Can we agree with that? Well, at least not the number. The, the reason I identified the picture was because of the guy that shot me. I, I, I hear what you think. Um, but uh, the, it I, can be a three, it can be a ten, it's the guy that shot me, that's who I identified. Okay. That's why I picked that picture. Right. I understand, but my question is, <coughs> did you remember whether that three was on there at the time? I don't recall. I see that picture in my sleep. I ever since I got subpoenaed to come here. Oh, hold on, hold on, wait, wait till there's a question. In addition to the confusion of this identification number, the defense says that the description provided originally of the shooter does not match Michael at all. The shooter was originally described by witnesses as six one and two hundred and twenty pounds, but Michael is only five nine and two hundred and twelve pounds. On top of this. The shooter was mentioned to have orangey-brown hair, whereas they say, at the time, he was going grey, 
an expert psychologist, takes the stand to testify about her opinion regarding memory and how memories are stored and accessed, especially ones that have been formed under times of high pressure. Is it your opinion that, based on what you reviewed, that um, the eyewitnesses and the victims had too short of a time period um, to view the perpetrator? That it was a very short time period. Are there some common misconceptions about a human being's memory that researchers have found? Yes. And what are those mis misconceptions? Um, some misconceptions are that um, memory can work like a video recorder, um, so that if you just kind of try hard enough, you can like close your eyes and like replay kind of the memory back. Um, in fact, memory is more um, of a reconstructive process. So each time you think of something from the past, you're actually kind of rebuilding that memory, right? Putting it back together. Um, another misconception is that um, really stressful or traumatic events um, are somehow different and that they will never be forgotten, that they're very accurate. Um, and so it's a, a misconception that we find um, in, our, in our research. Can a, a witness's memory change? Yes. And how can that occur? Um, there are multiple ways it can change. First, over time, um, sometimes we just forget um, information. Um, and so we're less likely to remember more information as time passes. Um, the other way it can change is if we learn information from other people or other sources after an event, that can actually affect um, our memory um, for the original event. To further complicate matters, an email had begun to circulate through the community shortly after the shooting, where people were accusing Michael of being the culprit. The origin of this email is unknown, but many of the witnesses had at some point seen it. The defense argues that this served to contaminate the investigation, providing people with unproven information as to who the shooter may be, thus placing bias on their conclusions. The defense goes into detail regarding Michael's injuries and recovery, saying that he had been rendered absolutely incapable of holding a weapon, let alone firing one, thus placing doubt on witness accounts who say they saw him target shooting, walking without issue, and using his hands for various tasks. He also had numbness in the sensory distribution of the radial nerve, which is in the back side of the radial half or the thumb side of the hand. Now, without the radial nerve functioning properly, did he have any ability to extend his wrist? No. Did he, um, and again, can you show us what, what position his wrist would have been in? Did he have any ability to extend his fingers? No. Did he have any ability to extend his thumb? No. Are those opinions within a reasonable degree of medical probability? Yes. So that was the x-ray after I fixated his bone yeah, with, uh, with uh, the bone graft, and you can see the wires going across, and then there's some plate and screws as well. This has been placed in his hand, and his fingers are placed in this part of the splint, so it allows him to have some active motion, and then his fingers are being ex passively extended by that splint. So really, is, is it fair to say that, that this splint is really doing the work and actively extending his fingers? Yeah, it could be misleading. You might think that, oh my God, he's moving his hand, but it's, it's the splints are doing the extension for him. And is that opinion within a reasonable degree of medical probability? Absolutely, yes. And at this time in, in July of 2010, did he have any ability to independently extend his fingers in his right hand? No, he did not. And at this time, did he have any uh, independent ability to extend <coughs> his thumb in his right hand? No. In August of uh, 2010, would Mr. Keatley have been able to uh, pick something up with his right hand? Very unlikely. Is that opinion within a reasonable degree of medical probability? Yes. Can you explain to us, in order for Mr. Keatley to have hold, held a gun in his right hand only, what would he have had to do? Possibly have had the gun in some sort of stabilized position before he got to it, or using his left hand to stabilize it for him to move his hand over the right gun to then help him do it. On November 25, 2010, when Mr. Keatley had been able to pump or slide a rack or a shotgun with his right hand, 
without first having to open or extend his fingers. It'd be very difficult to. Can you explain why that would be very difficult? Well, because racking a gun or racking a shotgun is a two-handed event where you have to stabilize the weapon with one hand and rack it with the other. And you actually have to be able to grab something to rack it. And it's actually a hard thing to do. It takes, it takes a lot of strength and coordination. Did Mr. Keatley have that strength or coordination back in November of 2010 based upon your review of the records, your observations of him, and based upon the testing? Not with his right hand. If I take this water bottle, the defendant cannot independently open if his because, hand's closed. Because what you just did is you open your fingers to right. grab onto that, right? You saw that, right? Yep, and so he cannot open his fingers to grab that. But if the water bottle is taken and fingers are moved out of the way and placed into his hand, he can hold it. Yes. He can continue to grip it. Yes. He can hold it between thumb and all of his fingers in a flexed, gripped position. Yes, he can. And he actually has the grip strength in that right hand, although decreased, to hold something if it's placed there. He does. He does. It's not strong. It's about half of what it normally would be. So, you know. So when we're talking about that 70 pound to 140 pound grip strength range, that's still maybe not what an adult male at his age would have for grip strength, but he can pick things up. Absolutely, yes. He can hold things. He can hold things, yes. Gallon of milk, if it's placed <coughs> into the hand by the handle, he can still hold that. He should be able to hold that, yeah. Okay, so when we're talking about items that are heavier, he's limited on that top end, but still has that grip strength to hold something once placed in that right hand. That's correct. So when you've got your arm right at your side, you're not taking into consideration movement of the torso, movement of the shoulders, or the upper back. So if we're talking about an internal rotation, that's not taking into consideration if I move my upper body. That's correct. So when we're talking about that 20 degree and limited range of motion, that's looking at an isolated circumstance, but not taking into consideration that there's adaptations. There can be adaptations. Okay. And that moving the entire body can be an adaptation to assist with a limited range of motion on a specific part of the body. I agree with you. A number of defense witnesses are presented to testify to the condition of Michael's physical health leading up to the shooting. That's when I noticed his hand, his right hand to shake mine didn't work like it should. So I switched hands. Describe what you meant by that. Um, he, the best way to describe it is he looked like he had had a stroke. So half his body didn't quite work like the other half. What about a limp or anything unusual about his walk or what we would call his he gait? He had, he had a limp. Was it significant to you? Um, There's no doubt when you, when you watched. Okay. So Around noon of November 25 of 2010, did you see Michael Keep? Yes, I did. Describe for me what you observed about his physical appearance. Well, when I got there, um, Michael was sitting in the living room. We just pretty much immediately started to serve dinner when I got there. Lunch, whatever you want to call it. Thanksgiving dinner. Um, when I got there and, you know, we all sat down at the table and ate. He sat next to his mother. Okay. Um, and what did his mother do? Well, she did ha have to help him cut his turkey and ham. We had both, I believe. Um, the meat up for him to, to eat. Was he able to use his right hand at that meal? No, not that I saw. His leg was more straight where he had to literally kind of pick his leg up to, to walk. He couldn't, it wasn't like a normal walk, like his knee wasn't bending. And therefore it was a clear permanent <coughs> from your observations. Yes. <laughs> The defense would provide phone records that show Michael's phone was not in use from the hours of 10.30 p.m. all the way through till the morning, and that his phone was located at his house all night, although the state would argue that he actively didn't use his phone and left it at home on purpose, seeing as he knew it would likely be traced should he be suspected of the shooting. The defense also highlights the fact that this area where the shooting took place was gang infested, dangerous people living all over it, criminal activity, drug deals, gang wars, and shootings were all quite common. They say the Thanksgiving shooting, realistically, 
could have been anyone who had a problem with the man named Creeper. They attempt to highlight problems with the expert bullet analysis and say that the images she chose to bring in to support her testimony don't accurately depict that the bullets recovered from his property match the ones found at the scene. Although the expert states that these are example images, and what she used to formulate her opinion comes from microscope analysis, the defense is not satisfied that this is accurate. They overall highlight what they believe to be poor detective work, interviews not recorded, leads not followed, no proof of Michael being read his Miranda rights, CCTV footage not looked for from neighboring houses, and contamination running through their witnesses. With both sides presenting an enormous amount of evidence over a three-week trial, the jury deliberates and comes to a decision. All right, Mr. Keatley, if you will please stand for the publishing of the verdict, and counsel, you may stand with him, and Madam Clerk, if you will please publish the verdict at this time. We, the jury, find as follows as to count one, the defendant is guilty of murder in the first degree as charged, and one, did the defendant personally carry, display, use, threaten, or attempt to use a firearm? Yes. Michael Keatley is found guilty on all charges and is sentenced to life without parole. It's at this point in the video that I've moved away from research and now speak from my own thoughts and opinions regarding the case. For a case that has no murder weapon, no DNA, fingerprints at the scene, clean phone location data, and a few reasons to somewhat doubt witness credibility, my opinion weighs heavily on the side of the fence that he did it, hey. Too many suspicious things that really got my eyebrow raising. Respraying his van urgently the day after the shooting. The journal with Creeper's home address and family details in it. His denial over and over that he was asking about this Creeper fellow. Those bullets found at his house that match the ones at the scene. If he's not guilty, those are some damn horribly unlucky coincidences. Likely, in my mind. He did do it. And if I take a moment to try get into the headspace of the man, there is a very small part of me that sympathizes with his struggle. That doesn't for a second mean I condone his actions, but this is my thought process when I sat down to ponder the situation. I remembered the first time I had been robbed by a few older thugs after school. They took a few things of importance to me, but nothing that wasn't replaceable. A small amount of pocket change, some school supplies, and most definitely my sense of safety regarding the walk home. But that was pretty much it. I remember when it was happening. I wasn't able to take the moment seriously. I thought this must be a mistake. Or maybe they're joking around with me. But after it had sunk in, the floodgates opened to feelings of being powerless, ashamed, and critical of myself that I didn't see it coming. Following the event, as the hours passed to days, my feelings transitioned from self-pity to anger and frustration. Although I never followed through with this, I wondered, should I carry a knife with me, seeing as I did live in a pretty bad area? Should I always make sure that I'm in a group when walking home? Should I actively look for these people and somehow try to make them pay? I'll never forget the constant lookout that lasted for years. Sometimes even to this day I wonder about them. I would scout every person that passed by me to see if I could recognize one of them. Who knows what I would have done if I did? Probably nothing. I have been in a tussle or two in my time, but I don't think I'm too good at starting them, hey. But nonetheless, I was hell-bent on fantasizing about revenge and that's for sure. Now I apply this feeling to Michael's situation. He almost died. His life changed forever, with surgery after surgery, and months of rehabilitation. The police weren't able to find the culprits, and I can absolutely imagine diving into a maddened state of fantasizing about justice being brought to those individuals. What they took from him was much more than $12, and I can't even begin to imagine what that feels like. But once again, that doesn't for a second excuse what he is convicted of doing. To dive into his headspace one step further, whatever understanding and sympathy I have for the man very quickly washes away when I think about his words in the police interview. He referred to these people as nothing more than shit. How delusional is that? I understand the area has high gang activity, 
But that doesn't mean that every single person walking the streets around there is a violent criminal. His lack of hesitation to callously praise the person who shot these unknown individuals really says a lot about how he thinks, and I don't like it. It makes me pretty uncomfortable. Furthermore, I was shocked to learn that many of these victims actually donated to Michael's cause when he was shot. People had started a fundraiser to help Michael pay for his medical bills, and a bunch of the victims would gift some of their money to help out the ice cream truck driver who many in the community were fond of. I said who would do something like that to a person for over fucking fourteen dollars, so I donated to the cause. Sure. So did Sir, uh, so did Juan. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Um, and then a couple months later, he would shoot us. Such kindness and generosity, only to be repaid months later by getting gunned down, watching their close friends whom they've known since children, cousins, brothers, good friends, all gone in an instant because of one man's snap decision to inflict the very pain he suffered on people that he considered possible villains, even if they weren't involved in his misfortune. It truly boggles the mind how good deeds like this don't go unpunished, and I hope this situation hasn't beaten that caring streak out of Gonzalo. Before I get ahead of myself, there was something that I wanted to show you which amused me to no end regarding this trial. I know that being amused within a horrible situation may sound quite odd, but you have to understand, these two trials spanned a total of seven weeks, every single day, watching hours upon hours of testimony, so it's only natural for the mind to grasp onto moments that waver from the constant and unstoppable serious intensity of it all. What caught my eye on this trial is actually the defense attorneys themselves. What a loud, angry bunch of rabble-happy folks they were, hey? Listen very closely. He said it doesn't work anymore. This is what happened to me. He was there all the time that Omar Balon is affiliated with gangs. We want to get the people that did this to you, Michael. And one of the reasons that you were trying to find out was because there was a reward. And it was a nice, big, fat, juicy one, right? And he'll even say in a statement with Detective Shram. We'll talk about him. You saw what you saw. Let's not use word on the street. Let's not use something that could contaminate you. To a certain extent, we can understand that. It's an African-American. Let's keep it that way. We'll find some African-American to charge. Objection, Your Honor. Stop interfering, sir. Let us do our work, sir. I mean, these guys were on another level. Audio waveforms were maxing out all over the place when they had the stage. And I must say, this style of lawyering led to some particularly interesting cross-examinations, especially when they came up against the more, let's just say, abrasive witnesses. What do you want me to say? The truth. That would be. That's what I want you to say is the truth. Did you shoot your guns on the Keatley property with Marty? I don't own a gun. Did you shoot your guns, meaning Marty had brought in a gun, right? Marty wanted to shoot his gun, his brand new gun that he had got. And you went with Marty to the Keatley property and you shot, right? Okay. Okay. That wasn't hard, was it? In 2010, in 2010, Michael was living with his parents after he was shot. Yes. And, and someone yes, tried to kill him, right? Yes, he was. Okay. And there was a reason that he was living with his parents, correct? Because he couldn't live alone, right? Because of his injuries. Okay, if you want to say that. I don't believe that, but... You would agree that the reason that you went to go work with him again was because he was physically pretty limited. Yeah, that's redundant. Let's go. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. I don't, I don't understand what you're wanting me to describe. Just tell me what you saw of the problems that he was having getting up and down. I mean, if you were with him... Right. I didn't ha see him have problems getting up and down. I saw him having problems moving his arm, but it, w <laughs> it wasn't that bad. Well, <clears throat> didn't stop him from being able to shoot a pistol. He was, as you call it, gimped up. Yep. Well, tell the jury what gimped up means. It means that he didn't move normal. 
Can you give them any better description than that? No, I can't. You can't. And by your own words, he was, I'm not going to use the ugly word, effed up. Those were your words. Sure. Michael Keatley, okay. your words was effed up. Right? Yeah. I'm effed up. Can you tell? We'll let the jury decide that. <clears throat> Did you listen to my question? You were going to possess a 45 caliber. His. Did I ask you whose it was right now? That wasn't the question. My question to you is you were going to possess that as part of your duties on that truck. Yes. You hadn't told him that you were a three-time convicted felon, right? Oh, he already knew that. Well, how, did, how did he know? You didn't because he, him. yes, I did. Oh, yes, I did. He knew it. He knew it before I ever got on that van that I was a convicted felon. Tell me what date you told him. The day I started working with him. Oh, so was that part of an application process? Okay, sure. If you want to be a smartass to me, I mean, I'll be a smartass back. Wait, I'm not going to allow that, all right? Just answer the questions. Tell the jury what a gangbanger. Uh, a gangbanger is somebody who's in a gang. And, and what? why do they call the last part banger? Got me. Why don't you enlighten me? So you have no idea why they call them gang bangers. I figured it's just a term they use. Why don't you enlighten me on the gang banger? Have you seen gang tags in the ocean mist? Community? Yes, I've seen all kinds of tags. And why don't you tell the jury what a gang tag is? A gang tag, I guess, is something that somebody spray paints on the wall with some kind of symbol or something. I. Their turf, right? I'm assuming so. You tag it, it's my turf. Right? I tag it, my turf. Does that mean if I go on the wall downstairs and piss on it, it's mine? Now... While you were working on this ice cream truck, you were trying to find out in this community who had robbed and shot Michael Keatley, correct? You had. You were trying to find out. Okay. And one of the reasons that you were trying to find out was because there was a reward. <laughs> okay. And it was a nice, big, fat, juicy one, right? If you say so, I don't think it's a juicy reward. And if you think money is my motivation, you did, you're just a bad lawyer. What you were telling him is that you were willing to kill whoever had done this to him and sacrifice your freedom. Is that a statement? Yeah. Okay. Correct? I don't know. You don't know. I'm willing to kill anyone who takes away another person's civil liberties. Okay. And so that's what you were going to do. That was your plan. Your plan was, I'm going to find these people, and then I'm going to kill I them. had no plan. Well, you just said that that's what you wanted to do, right? You I said to... anyone who takes away another person's civil liberties deserves to die. And then you can go to prison, and you're just sacrificing yourself for that, right? I would, yes. Because uh, you wanted to let him know that you were kind of like a martyr, correct? Really? That's what you were telling him, that really? you were a martyr. A martyr? Yep. Yeah. I'm not going to respond to that. You told Mr. Keatley, did you not, that you would like to tie up those individuals to a stump and let the alligators do the rest. I might have made a statement like that, okay? And that's what you were telling Mr. Keatley, because you wanted him to feel like you were I didn't really want trying him to, to feel like anything. But if, you, if you're asking me if that's the way I feel, then if anybody wants to shoot anybody else and harm another person or do any kind of harm to another person, yeah, I would like to see anyone be tied to a stump and let the alligators and snakes do the rest. Is that why you put a gun to his head? Because you, you can stop him the a person. Let me out. The reason that you put the gun to my client's head is because he gave you, quote, an intelligent insult. Right? 
He insulted my intelligence. And that's why you say you put a gun to his head and it took everything in your power not to pull that trigger. It did take everything. Because your intent at that point was to kill him. Objection, speculation. No, it's his, his intent, so that's over. Your intent My was intent to kill was him. to get out of that vehicle. That's all I wanted to do is get away from him. That's all I was trying to do. You was get away from him. That's all I wanted was to get away from him. Because of the That's all I wanted was to get away from him. Because of the intelligent insult. Because he is a bad person and he put my life into jeopardy. What was the intelligent insult? I don't recall it. He makes all kinds of intelligent snide remarks. And you hear him long enough to get tired of it. You want to get away from it. Is there any reason that you were so insistent on having to shoot at the Keatley property that you are calling him repeatedly about shooting on this property when you're living on five acres in a ranch where you do target practicing? Why are you calling him insistently on wanting to shoot on this property when you've got five acres to shoot? Why are you being so dramatic about it? Uh, that's me. It's my personality. It's ridiculous. Okay. Yeah. The reason I, I didn't call him insistently, I may have called him one time before that. You just said and it didn't work out because my my schedule was busy or his schedule was busy. I didn't call him consistently. I didn't. I called him maybe one other time, if any. So, <clears throat> what are you talking about? You knew the people because you knew that that house was the gang house of Ocean Mist. No, it's, um, not a, it's, it's not. It's not meant to be funny. Well, it's not meant to be dramatized like you're making it either. Jeez. You knew that that was a gang house, right? No, I knew that it wasn't a gang house. Answer: I realized. I looked over, and he was trying to get them in, and he was having a little trouble. So I was like, you know, you want me to do this for you, you know? And he was having trouble with his hands. Yes, he was. You're a good storyteller. <laughs> The way you're telling it is not the way I said it. What do you with you all wanna, the emotion do, do and you all wanna, the drama? Do you want to read it to see if if no, any of the words need to read were it. incorrect? The words was perfect, but I didn't have the same drama that you put in with it. Jeez, I'll tell you right now, it was a damn mission getting that little edit there down to what I did. There was hours upon hours of this sort of back and forth as the defense attorneys grilled civilians and law enforcement alike. No one was safe from the, as that witness just put it, the drama. Taking a more serious tone now, I'm well aware that the area where this took place is by no means a shining example of a safe community, and I'm also aware that some of the victims do have criminal records. From what I could find though, there's nothing more serious than drug-related offenses. No murders, assaults, or anything of the sorts. Furthermore, information presented during the trial shows that these guys were a really good bunch of blokes. Rough around the edges, for sure, but not the piece of shits that Michael seemed to believe everyone who lived in that street was. Watching Daniel Beltran break down on the stand was one of the more emotional moments I've had with the trial in some time. I couldn't help but to picture one of the many gatherings I've been to in the past, getting together with a group of close friends, enjoying the night, only to have it ripped apart by some crazed gunman. I truly hope each and every one of them is recovering as best they can from the injuries, and are able to find peace with the situation, having two of their close friends and relatives torn from the world right in front of them, and now sentenced to a life of difficulty, seeing as the bullet wounds has affected each and every one of them in different ways. But for each victim, it's left a lasting internal scar that although can heal with time, will never go away. I unfortunately couldn't find much information at all regarding the two brothers who passed away, 28-year-old Juan and 22-year-old Sergio Guitron. What I did find, though, was many ripples through social media and community posts regarding the loss of these two men. By all accounts, it seemed like they were good guys living in a rough neighborhood, and they left behind many friends and family who loved them dearly. As written on their obituary, they were beloved sons, cousins, friends, 
and will never be forgotten. Bueno, mi pregunta para él, lo que siempre he querido preguntarle, ¿por qué mató a mis hijos? Y quiero preguntarle cómo se siente, si siente su conciencia tranquila, o el, qué es lo que él siente, si no se arrepiente. Me quitó la mitad de mi vida, me destrozó mi corazón y sí. mis hijos. Mis hijos es lo único que yo tenía, los amaba y los amo con todo mi corazón. Y quiero saber cómo él se siente. And I want to know. Sabiendo que eran unos, unos muchachos inocentes y no le hacían daño a nadie menos a él. Lo siento por culpa de él, no pude ser abuela, no pude tener, ellos no pudieron seguir su vida, hacer su vida. I really don't know what to say. I didn't write nothing down. I just going off of it. I just want to know why you took them. Like you took two good people. You were a coward that night. You um, hurt so many people. You hurt this lady losing her two kids. We know what you did that night, and you know what you did that night. You hurt us. You've caused so much pain to everyone involved in here. And the way you're showing yourself in this courtroom shows the person that you are. They say forgiving people helps you heal, but I can't forgive you. Um, you took two really good people away from this world that were doing the right things in life. And that hurts a lot. I forgive you what you did because I know it's not you it's the devil in you and you should let go of that you should ask God to forgive you because you ain't escaping none of his wrath not even the human wrath that you just heard Just, I would just like to tell you to ask God to forgive you. Maybe you can find forgiveness and then live a better life as to eternal life. So other than that, you're going straight to hell. And ain't escaping that. No matter how many years or whatever it is your sentence that they would give you. If you don't ask God to forgive you, you're going to hell regardless. And I've been seeking for God ever since you did what you did to me. Because I know he has a purpose that he left me alive. And i like to share that with you. Because, yeah, in order for me to get forgiven for what I did. Whatever I have done, no matter what, what level it is. I know I gotta forgive you in order for God to forgive me. So I forgive you. Because I care about my salvation and the way that I be with, in front of God. Hope you do too. God bless you, brother. That's all I can say to you. Thank you.